Eddie Edelman here. Um, and this program will be recorded and posted on the Camden Public Library YouTube channel. So if you know someone who wanted to make it here but couldn't be here tonight, then uh, we can uh, make sure that they'll see it on the YouTube channel. Um, also, any Zoom people, feel free to type your questions into the chat or Q&A, and I'll read them out loud at any point. And same goes for uh, people in the audience, but you can ask your own questions. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're pleased to have Eddie Edelman here. He's an AP award-winning essayist. His columns and short essays have appeared in the Portland Press Herald, the Bangor Daily News, and on Maine Public Radio since 1998. He also is a playwriter, and his plays have been produced in Los Angeles, Portland, and Belfast. And Eddie hosts a weekly radio show called The Soundings every Saturday at 10 a.m. on WERU Community Radio. Tonight, he'll be reading from his new and mostly humorous collection of newspaper columns, radio essays, and one-act plays called Don't Get Me Started, but we are going to get you started right now. So <laughs> I'll turn it over to you, Eddie. All right. Well, um, thanks, folks, for coming and for the Zoom audience. Um, thank you all for coming tonight, and um, I think the hour should go by pretty quickly. Um, I think you'll find it uh, to be entertaining enough so that um, you're not looking at your watches. So thank you for coming tonight, and uh, let's get started, okay? So um, here's how the night is going to go. I'm hoping to read four or five essays from the book and to end the evening with a short surprise piece. That's not an essay and not in the book. And in between the essays, I'll talk about my 25 year writing journey, my process and some tricks that I learned along the way. By the way, this is not, as you can see, it's not a bullet point presentation. Um, I'll be reading from notes. And as you'll see, I'm not, I'm not a slick professional uh, speaker, just a regular guy who had the audacity to publish a book but I hope this talk will inspire some of you to finally pick up a pen or dust off that piece you started years ago and you're now ready to pick it up again. By the way, feel free to ask questions anytime during the talk and I'll be signing books after the talk. If you're curious, the book is $17, but it's old school payment, cash your checks. Um, and as you might guess, I don't have one of those nifty um, MasterCard things that are 21st century. Um, and if, if you don't have the money, just take the book and mail me a check. And for those of you who are watching on Zoom, um, it's available at Sherman's in Rockland. Um, Barn Swallow Books in Rockport has it. And you can also pick it up on Amazon. Okay. Again, I'll be, I'll be um, weaving in my own personal writing journey between each essay. And that journey will be in a traditional three-act structure. Act one, how I actually got into writing back in the 1990s. Act two, a really brief overview of my 25 years of writing. And act three, how this self-published book came about. Oh, did I tell you I have a book? So, I'll start with an essay that I'm sure everyone in this room can relate to. It's called, please hold. This was written in 2018. And I think uh, Bangor Daily News was the one that published it. Okay, please hold. Can you remember a time when home phones actually had chords? And when the phone rang, a chorus of children's voices would shout, I'll get it as the kids raced to the phone. Who could it be? Anne Helen, Grandpa Max, the coach of the Little League team? It didn't matter. Whoever it was, was an instant celebrity. Fast forward to 2018, when landlines have become an endangered species. But if you're a dinosaur like me, the landline still has a prominent place in your home. But how likely are you to run to the phone when it's just another telemarketer telling you that you've won an all expenses paid vacation to Bora Bora. Break out the Bermuda shorts, honey. We finally won something. During election season, it seems like the phone rings nonstop 
with pollsters who just want a few minutes of my time or candidates who want my vote. It goes something like this. Hi, this is fill in the blank. And the reason I'm running is fill in the blank. Wow, that is so fascinating. I had no idea. And don't get me started on credit card companies. Due to your excellent credit rating, blah, blah, blah. The really sneaky marketers, and maybe some of you can relate to this, the really sneaky marketers are now using the local phone exchange as the number that shows up on the caller ID. I've actually seen my own phone number appear on the caller ID. Now that's creative, diabolical, but creative. What's that? Sounds illegal. Sounds illegal, yeah. Try finding where they are. We're going to get them. <laughs> but that's only half the equation. What about calling out? As Betty Davis once said, fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. So you get your credit card statement, and on it is a purchase of a half pound of caviar for $765. And the closest you've ever gotten to caviar is Mrs. Paul's fish sticks. Once the initial shock wears off, you take a deep breath and dial the number at the top of the page. That's when you hear that soothing voice. Thank you for calling Acme Credit Cards. Your call is important to us, so please listen carefully as our options have changed. Are you as sick as I am of hearing that <laughs> phrase? Whatever. You need to stay focused and never lose sight of the real goal, an actual human being on the other end. The soothing voice continues. To apply for a card, press one. To make a payment or billing questions, press two. To find out more about our rewards program, press three. All other callers, you're on your own. So you press two and hope for a real person, yet another recording. To direct you to the right associate, we'll need to ask you a few questions. Anybody can relate to this? <laughs> oh no, here come the questions. You listen patiently and press more digits, having been assured that a live representative is next. Your spirits are lifted until you hear, we are experiencing unusually high call volumes. Expected wait time is between 30 and 40 minutes. You might want to try your call later. Now, here's where the rubber meets the road. How badly do you want it? If you're Warren Buffett, perhaps you hang up. But you're not Warren Buffett. It's $765, damn it. So you decide to wait. And that's when the music comes on. The bleeping music. It's not what's written here. The bleeping music. Welcome to the elevator that never stops on your floor. But you're a mature adult, so instead of sitting there, you multitask. You, you wash your dishes, make a ham sandwich, rearrange your sock drawer, and remove the lint from your navel. And finally, at minute 39, a human voice, but it's a voice with a heavy accent. Are you feeling this, folks? It's a voice with a heavy accent. Now, I'm as PC as the next guy, but in order to move the conversation forward, one needs to understand what's being said on the other end. Yet somehow you muddle through. And after 20 minutes of back and forth, without a positive outcome, you demand to speak to the supervisor. You're put on hold once again until, until the line goes dead. <laughs> You know that part of you that you hope no one ever sees? Please hope. <laughs> Thank you. Very relatable. Very relatable, isn't it? Who hasn't been there? Who yeah. hasn't been there? Just two days ago, I was trying to get Verizon on the phone with oh. an actual person. Oh. And, I, and I, she heard, she was in the basement and I'm upstairs. She heard me cussing <laughs> at the phone. Yeah. Never did go to the back. No. It, it, oh, yeah by, the, yeah. by the time I got to, you know, we'll turn you over to an agent in just a minute. 
And the next thing I heard was, our offices are closed now. Go back tomorrow. Oh, and they don't care because they don't have to see you. There's no, there's, no. there's no human. It's like I'm going home. I'm going home. Okay. So, so this is Act One. How my, how it all began. For most of my life, I never saw myself as a writer. I graduated college in the early '70s from a hippie school in California, Sonoma State College, with a degree in English. But if not for pass-fail courses and cliff notes, I never would have graduated. I wasn't what you'd call hungry for knowledge. I saw the outside world, not college, as my real teacher. I couldn't wait to get started, and I dove right in. Once I graduated, I drove a taxi cab off and on for five years in New York City and got a crash course in life. It was those tangible things that I couldn't possibly learn from Socrates. In 1977, I moved to Portland, Maine and opened a small record shop there for the next 24 years. But around year 20, I got bored with business and needed a new challenge. So I began writing short humor essays at first, 500 to 1,000 words. Long story short, I secured a weekly column with the Portland Press Herald and I had a semi-regular gig on Maine Public Radio, reading my essays aloud on Maine Things Considered. But I also wanted to write fiction. So I pursued screenwriting. And in 2003, here's where it gets good. In 2003, I closed my business, sold my home, packed up my 1993 Ford Escort station wagon, and moved to Los Angeles without knowing a soul but I'll save that for act two. <laughs> act one takeaway, you're never too old to take up writing. Here's one of the first pieces I ever wrote back in 1998, but over the years it's been updated to make it more current and topical since I name names. It's called, Are You a Morning Person? If I had to pick my favorite humor essay, it might be this one. How you folks on Zoom doing? You still there? I'm there? All right. Okay, this is called Are You a Morning Person? Um, it's one of the earliest pieces I ever wrote, but I kept updating it because I named names. And back then I was naming Willard Scott, Michael Jackson. I mean, names that you wouldn't actually think of right today. So you'll see that when it comes up. All right, Are You a Morning Person? I've come to the conclusion that the world is divided into two basic categories, morning people and what I like to call the others. For better or worse, you had the others like in the horror movies, you know, the people that were at the other end of town in the dark, the others. Um, for better or worse, I fall into the latter group. When morning breaks, I don't just hop out of bed and become a productive member of society. It's more like a slow crawl to the bathroom followed by a forced march to the coffee pot. I tried being a morning person once, only to roll over and go right back to sleep. The die was cast. I would never be the early bird who caught the worm. Morning people are generally goal-oriented. They have post-it notes all over the house. Eat more fiber. Rotate tires. Zumba at 5.15. They complete half of their daily tasks before I even open my eyes, and they never fail to remind me of this over and over. It's hurtful. Please stop. So are you a morning person or one of the others? If you're not sure, I've sketched out several group profiles to help identify yourself. Do you start your day with half a grapefruit, 100% whole grain cereal, ground roast decaffeinated coffee, and the Wall Street Journal to check out the latest interest rates on 30-year treasury bonds? These are all telltale signs of a morning person. However, if you start your day with cold pizza, a Snickers bar, a can of Red Bull, reruns of the Big Bang Theory, and wondering where all your clean clothes are, you're definitely one of the others. 
If your idea of a night on the town is having a glass of wine or the latest microbrew with dinner and getting home by 9.30 for a decent bedtime, you're probably a morning person. However, if you start your night out with the words bartender, whiskey, and leave the bottle, you're likely one of the others. If you drive a Volvo station wagon with side impact airbags, a child safety seat, and have a bumper sticker that reads, I'm proud of my middle school honor student. <laughs> Odds are you're a morning person. However, if you drive a beat up 1993 Buick with bald tires, an ashtray full of cigarette butts, and have a bumper sticker that reads, my kid just beat up your honor student, you're a card carrying member of the others. Your name is on a list in Washington, DC. Be prepared to testify for, before a Senate subcommittee. Does the inside of your refrigerator look like a well manicured lawn? Are all the food groups well represented and on their proper shelves? And do you regularly check for expiration dates? The smart money says you're a morning person. On the other hand, if you open your refrigerator door and see nothing but half eaten Chinese food containers, discolored vegetables sprouting arms and legs, and a quart of milk that expired during the Reagan administration, it's probably time for an intervention. Are you still not sure which category you fall into? Perhaps you can identify with certain people, certain famous people who define these groups. Barack Obama is a morning person. This is where it got updated. <laughs> Barack Obama is a morning person. Donald Trump is not. Martha Stewart is a morning person. Dracula is not. Bambi is a morning person. Godzilla is not. Obi-Wan Kenobi is a morning person. Darth Vader is not. Bing Crosby is a morning person. Keith Richards, you kidding? <laughs> so that's it. By now you should know which category you fall into. To all the others like me who feel a bit unworthy, take heart. There's a growing pool of scientific evidence to suggest that morning people are actually alien beings sent here from another galaxy to colonize the earth and reverse the natural order of our planet. The evidence further suggests that these interstellar busybodies are homesick and are about to return to their galaxy and this might be the best three words I've ever written, and are about to return to their galaxy, Alpha Smarty Pants. <laughs> Earthlings will once again sleep in and joyfully arise to Good Morning America, airing at its rightful time slot, noon. <laughs> okay. I love that one. Act two. So which category are you in? Oh, I'm definitely not a morning person. I, I couldn't have written it if I was. Takes one to know one. All right, act two, screenwriting in Hollywood. Like I said, in 2003, I pulled up stakes and moved to LA. By then I had written two screenplays. The first one, Dog Poopy. By the way, poopy wasn't the word in my head. But the second one was Gangbusters. It's a fictional story about the first female jockey to win the Kentucky Derby. By the way, it's on my website, which you'll find on my business card. And for those of you uh, online, I've left some business cards here and you can pick them up and it'll have information to the website and you know, um, just personal emails and stuff like that. Um, and if, if you want, if you have a pen nearby and you want to write it down, the website is tellyourlifestory.net. That's Y-O-U-R, tellyourlifestory.net. But again, if you don't get it now, just go to the front desk. They'll have some business cards and you can pick it up there. That screenplay was actually optioned twice. And I actually read it over parts of it the other night. And I'm just going to brag on myself. It was really good. You know, and I'm, I'm sitting there weeping and I'm going, Ed, snap out of it. You wrote this, okay? <laughs> so, um, but after four years of trying in LA, I knew I wasn't going to achieve my screenwriting dream. 
and I definitely did not want to die in Los Angeles. Uh, so in 2007, I crawled back to Maine on my belly. I settled in Belfast where I continue to write essays to this day. And I began writing short plays, four of which are in this book. Once again, 17 bucks, the best 17 bucks you'll ever spend. Okay. Also in 2011, I began writing personal history books for folks who wanna tell their life story, but taking the time to write it all down would be too time consuming or too intimidating. So I sit down uh, with the client and I, auto, I audio record 10 or 12 hours of personal interviews on any topics or time periods they wish to talk about. Then I transcribe those interviews into a clean narrative, add in photos, and then design a hardcover book to pass along, pass along to friends and future generations. This is an example of the books that I do. This is for a couple I did who live in Northport. They have a home there and they did their life story and it's got pictures in it. And kind of a cool thing. He was a teacher and so we have pictures of her students and he's a photographer. And let me just take a moment to show you how cool it is that here's an example of what he got to do, which was to have his photos on shiny. Isn't that great? And so that's, that's what I do for people who want to tell their life story and have it put into a book. You can uh, pass it along to children, grandchildren, future generations. So, oh no, no, it's, yeah. But, and I'll travel, you know, if, you, if you're in New Guinea, I'm on a plane <laughs> with my tape recorder. All right. Um, I've also done business writing, magazine articles, poetry. I even tried writing a novel once. You name it, I've tried it. And it was all pretty much self-taught. Act two takeaway, you don't need a lot of formal education or any for that matter to pursue writing. Let me repeat that. You don't need a lot of formal education. You just need passion, passion and drive. Find a format you love, study the successful writers in that format, and then just copy the bleep out of them. Bleep not being the word in my head. And do that initially, just like they did when they were first starting out. And don't worry, eventually you'll find your own voice. By the way, I studied and modeled myself after Dave Barry, the syndicated humor columnist. Anyone know Dave Barry? You know, yeah, he's great. It's just, um, he's a good writer. He's a great writer. Yeah, he had a weekly column. Uh, he's out of Miami. He's a great writer. There's a writing adage that I just love. Keeping in mind what I said before, copying the bleep out of them. The writing adage is, good writers borrow, great writers steal. Just ask Shakespeare. Because there were no new ideas, just new ways of telling old ideas. The wheel has already been invented, but maybe not the bicycle or the Model T or the skateboard. One last thing, if time and money allow, go to a seminar, preferably by a doer, someone who has actually faced live ammunition. Okay, here's the piece that won the AP Award for Writing in Broadcast Journalism in 1998 on Maine Public Radio. Ironically, it's not one of the humor essays, but folks really seem to dig it. It's called World Series, World Series Game Six. Keep the Kleenex handy. What year was it that it won that? Um, this was in 1990, let me, let me get back to the camera. This, this was in 1999 and um, I want to get my papers right here so I don't lose my place. And it was actually um, inspired by the fact that the Red Sox 
were hosting the All-Star Game that year. And Carlton Fisk was being honored at the All-Star Game. For those of you who are old enough, Carlton Fisk played for the Red Sox, as you'll hear in this essay. Okay, this is World Series Game 6. So this was written almost 25 years ago. Mention the year 1975 to any New England sports fan over 35, and you're bound to get an earful. It was the year the Red Sox made it to the World Series, and Carlton Fisk hit that dramatic home run to end game six, considered by many to be the greatest World Series game ever played. And for those of you who remember the visual, it's him putting his arms up as he's going to first base, trying to wave the ball fair. So it's kind of a famous image. I was living in Boston that year, and I can still recall the surge of electricity that flowed through that town. My excitement, however, was tempered by the death of my father that same year. I didn't grow up in Boston, though. I was raised in New York City in the 50s and 60s on a steady diet of Mickey Mantle, Willie Mays, and Sandy Koufax. I can see you nodding. <laughs> and like a lot of young boys growing up in that era, baseball was the glue that cemented the bonds between my father and me. Among my fondest memories as a child was eating peanuts with my father in the bleachers at Yankee Stadium, watching the 62 World Series against the Giants and the 63 World Series against the Dodgers. But the strongest bond between my father and me resulted from our actually playing baseball. On Saturday mornings, before anyone else was awake, the two of us would go to the schoolyard with a bat and a bunch of balls. He would pitch the balls to me and I'd hit them all over the schoolyard. Then he'd have to retrieve them because there was no one else on the field. All of this paid off in my very first Little League game when I actually fouled off a pitch in my very first at bat before finally striking out. I'm just gonna take a drink of water. It gets better folks, get the Kleenex out. If you like this part, you're gonna like the rest. I've long since forgotten my first kiss, but I'll never forget that first foul ball. Any hits I got after that were nothing more than window dressing, which brings me back to 1975 and my father's death. I was a young man in my mid twenties and it was my first experience with the death of someone close to me. I didn't know what to expect or how to react at the funeral. So I showed my grief in the only way I knew how. I summoned up the memory of those Saturday mornings when a middle-aged man chased baseballs for a couple of hours just so his son could foul off a pitch in his first Little League game. A month after my father's death, I was back in Boston, still quite despondent and feeling an overwhelming need to reconnect with him. As if on cue, the Red Sox were kind enough to be playing in the World Series that night. I had befriended a nine-year-old boy that year named Richie. He and his divorced mother lived in my apartment building. I asked her if I could take Richie to Fenway Park with me, even though there was no guarantee of getting in. The game was already sold out, and it was a school night. Please, Mom. Oh, all right. Richie threw on his jacket, and we bolted for Fenway Park, faster than you could say Carl Yastrzemski. We spent three frustrating hours in Kenmore Square, trying to get tickets. Richie feared we'd never get in. I, on the other hand, had no doubt. A half hour before the first pitch, we got two seats for $75. Can you tell this was the 90s? I, I, can you tell it was the 70s? We got two seats for $75 that were way out in right field, past the foul pole, but we were in. It was Richie's first major league ball game, so I had no idea how it would affect him. He was kind of a reserved child, but that night he lit up like a pinball machine. He was blown away by everything. The hot dogs, the green monster, the foul pole, the scoreboard, and especially the two guys that were sitting next to us. They really took a shine to Richie and entertained him through all 12 innings pure joy. 
A lot of people remember game six of the 1975 World Series for the great heroics on the field. But for that shy nine-year-old boy, it will always be about the two friends he made that night who taught him how to have fun. And for this 25-year-old boy, it was an unforgettable lesson in how to deal with death while celebrating life. I haven't been to a Major League Baseball game since the early 1980s. I hardly even follow it in the newspapers anymore. The snowballing effect of strikes, fake grass, multi-million dollar salaries, dome stadiums, and color-coordinated polyester uniforms eventually took its toll. But I still love the game. So whenever I feel the need to reconnect with my father, I just grab a bag of peanuts and head out to the nearest Little League field. If I'm lucky, if I'm really, really lucky, I'll have the thrill of watching a young kid foul off his very first pitch. At that moment, we're all caught in Fisk. And that foul ball, it just won game six of the 1975 World Series. Okay, give you a moment to wipe your eyes. <laughs> um, this is Act Three, the book. Some of you may have heard that back in 2020, there was a pandemic. I know, shocking, isn't it? Somebody had to tell you. Somebody had to let you know. And it's funny because I was thinking today, we have such short memories. But remember standing online outside of Hannaford? waiting to get into Hannaford because they were only letting certain amounts of people in. Just wanted to remind you what 2020 was like, okay? So you don't forget. Remember, you know, wiping off cardboard boxes? Just remember all that because no one knew what was going on. So anyway, back in 2020, there was a pandemic. Back then, lots of us had lots of time in our hands. So my pandemic project was to clean out all the bleep in my apartment, not the word in my head. And there, was a, and there was a bleep load of bleep. It took me a month and a half with lots of trips to the dump. And in that process, I ran across newspaper copies of many of the columns that I'd written over 20 some odd years. And I found them to be quite entertaining. I know I'm bragging, but I found them to be quite entertaining. And I thought, what if I choose the best two or three dozen, clean them up, and put them in a book? Fortunately, I had a neighbor who was really tech savvy. He helped me put the book together. He helped me put, he helped me put the book together at a very neighborly price. It took a little over a year from inception to actually holding the book in my hands. If you're curious, and I'm not, I'm not here to tout any firm over another, but we used Am Amazon's Kindle Direct Publishing for the publishing and the printing, and it was relatively cheap and painless. Act three takeaway, don't be intimidated by the prospect of a book. It's a lot less daunting than you might think. Really, it is. Oh, okay, if I can do it, anyone can do it. Okay, on to the next essay about my depraved addiction to weather. It's called, and I love this title, I Get No Kick from Champagne. Think opiates are bad? Wait till you hear this. Hello, my name is Eddie. I'm a weather addict. For most folks, weather is nothing more than a topic of conversation like, what a beautiful day, or they're calling for more snow. But for me, weather is nothing short of a full-blown addiction. And let me tell you, it ain't that pretty at all. As I write these words, so again, this is 1998. And one of the things I'm, I'm gonna tell you before I keep going, in here, I'm going to mention the word Republican. And remember, it's, it's 1998. Think about the coat and tie, you know, um, very dependable, 
Republican people, not not what you see today. So just remember those guys, okay? Um, as I write these words, and let me tell you, it ain't that pretty at all. As I write these words, I'm unable to go more than an hour without bellying up to some TV set for the Weather Channel's tropical update or your local on the eights. Yep. Weather maps excite me. Doppler radar, just the mere thought of it triggers the release of dopamine in my brain. I keep asking myself, how did I get here? I had what most would consider a normal childhood. I grew up on the streets of Brooklyn, riding my bike, playing stickball, and dodging stray bullets on the subway. But all that changed when I got to college. It was 1968. Experimentation was all the rage. A bunch of students would gather in a dorm, put a towel under the door, blast the rolling stones, and turn on the first 24-hour weather channel. It consisted of nothing more than a series of dials showing temperature, wind speed, humidity, and barometric pressure in black and white, no less. Oh, it all seemed so innocent at the time. I really like this next line, but doesn't it always start that way? After a while, my schoolmates would head off to class, but not me. I lingered for hours on end just to watch the wind speed dial move from three miles per hour to four miles per hour. Sure, it was exhilarating, <laughs> but it was also dangerous. Clearly, I was playing with fire. Needless to say, this deviant behavior put a serious cramp in my social life. I wasn't exactly a co-ed magnet or dean's list material. For years, I kicked around from college to college, yet in spite of it all, I maintained a solid C average and graduated from a hippie school in California, thanks again, in large part to cliff notes and pass fail courses. My future was bright, but it was not to be. While many of my classmates moved on to more common urges, such as alcohol, drugs, gambling, tobacco, and caffeine, or just gave up and became Republicans, my weather monkey resurfaced years later in the most hideous manner. In the early 80s, a new highly potent weather channel emerged, and it was like nothing I'd experienced before. It had radar information, tornado and hurricane tracking, regional maps, five-day planners, and deadliest of all, really hot-looking weather babes. <laughs> I was toast. I didn't stand a chance. Since then, my life has been spiraling downhill. What began as innocent curiosity has turned into utter depravity. But enough is enough. So last year, I sought out professional help. As part of my therapy, my counselor suggested I develop a simple test for others to detect the telltale signs of this devastating illness. So here goes. Please answer truthfully. Do you feel the need to watch the Weather Channel when you first wake up? Do you know the names of every projected hurricane this year? I know a lot of you are going to relate to this next one. Do you view local news merely as filler before and after the weather segment? And during lovemaking, does your mind wander, knowing there's a tropical depression? forming in the Gulf of Mexico. Honey, hold that position. I'll be right back. I just got to check on something. Do you secretly long to be a TV meteorologist and engage in bouncy repartee with a much too bubbly news anchor? If you answered yes to at least, if you answered yes to at least three of these questions, you're a weather addict and you need to seek professional help today. Just dial 1-800- I want to live. If you answered yes to all five, forget the call. It's much too late for that. You need to book your sorry butt, not the word in my head, you need to book your sorry butt on the next nonstop flight to the Betty Ford Clinic. Okay, let's review. This is your brain, and this is your brain on weather. 
Are there still any questions? Okay. My last bit of talk. Yes, how may I help you? Ever consider becoming a meteorologist? <laughs> no, and it's one of the great regrets of my life. It's one of the great regrets of my life. The thought of putting on those, those gaudy blazers, you know, and, and no, but um, yeah, I actually showed it. Uh, a couple of the meteorologists around the state have read it and got a kick out of it. So, all right. My writing process. This is the part I think both mine and hopefully it'll, it'll, it'll um, talk to you guys as well. So I'm usually sitting where you are right now, listening to an author talk. Being up here, it's like eating at the adults table. <laughs> and as a writer, the one question I always want to ask him or her is, what is your, what is your writing routine, your process? How does the magic happen? And I've come to find out no two routines are alike. I can only tell you what mine is. I can only tell you what mine is. I'm most creative in the morning after a good night's sleep. I call sleep, and anybody you can steal, any writers out there, you can steal this if you want. I call sleep the cleansing of the writing palette. But truth be told, my, my writing actually starts the night before. I hate looking at a blank page. So I actually start that morning's writing the night before. And the stakes are so low because the night before, I'm just kind of scribbling. I don't really have my writer's hat on. I'm just playing around, but I'm not. So here's an example. Let's say it's a scene in a screenplay. The night before, I'll just write down the first bit of description or opening dialogue. For example, description. It's 8.47 in the evening. A middle-aged woman sits on her living room couch. Her eyes stare straight ahead, not blinking, as her fingers tap nervously on the armrest. Her husband walks through the door. His tie is slightly crooked. Before he can say a word, she calmly says, traffic again? And that is what I'm looking at first thing in the morning. Now I'm ready to write. I never assume that the muse will suddenly appear to inspire me. The cavalry is not coming to save me. But wait, I've got my cheat sheet. Perhaps some of you have considered writing a memoir. I always give the exact same advice. Create a cheat sheet. Before you start writing, go out and buy a brand new notebook. You can go to Rite Aid. You don't have to go to some fancy place. Go to Rite Aid, buy a brand new notebook, and then buy a fancy pen that you only use with that notebook. And think about all the topics you want to cover. For example, topics, motherhood, that summer on Vinyl Haven, your time in the military, your very first car, alcoholism, skydiving, your love of crochet. And at the top of each page, just write the topic. So all you're writing is the topic. And don't necessarily think of your book as a straight line biography. You can, but know that you don't have to. Think topics. Dozens and dozens of them. One page, one topic. So you've got your new notebook and a shiny pen. At the top of the first page, the title reads, my very first car. And then bullet point. Everything you can remember about that car. How you saved up to buy it. The cigarette lighter that didn't work. The first time you started it up the candy apple red color of the outside, rolling down the windows on that glorious spring day, making out at the drive-in. Bullet point as much as you can remember, more is more is more. And before you know it, you're at the bottom of that bullet point page. And now you're ready to write. You've created your very own muse. 
your cheat sheet. All right. But that's just my process. There's a lot of great writers who don't want to be saddled with all that preparation and all those lists. It stifles their spontaneity. They want to be surprised. Where will, where will their creativity take them today? And their way of writing is just as valid as mine. I say whatever works. And this is perhaps to the writers out there uh, or wannabe writers. I have a thing on the top of my computer screen that says the following four words. It's the reader, stupid. And I always understand that I'm not writing for myself. I'm writing for someone else. And I always have to keep that in mind. If I were reading this and I didn't know Eddie and I didn't know how, what a wonderful person he was and how this thing ends and all the things that he's done and, and all the reasons I should love him, why do I even care? It's the reader stupid. You've got to kind of say to yourself, how do I, how do I erase all of this and become just this, can I say schmuck? And just become this schmuck reading a book, you know, or being in a Barnes and Noble. Why would I pick up this book instead of another book? It's the reader stupid. It's, it's constantly understanding that you're writing for someone else. Okay, that's just my... Uh, um, Side trip there. Okay, make no mistake, writing can be tough and downright deflating at times. And I know I'm speaking for a lot of writers when I say that, but I can promise you when it's good, when it's really, really good, it's a high like no other. And that's the end of the talking part. So I want, um, and I'm gonna read one, we've got time. I'll read one more of the, um, essays, and then I'll leave you with that last short piece that I wanted to do. I, I, we're actually ahead of where I thought, so. Um, this piece I wrote in 2001, and for those of you, for those of you who've ever worked in a group, uh, um, in a corporation or an organization, I think you'll be able to appreciate this. This piece is called Mission Statements. I know, just the title itself, right? I don't even have to read it. It's like saying prunes, you know, mission statements. Mission statements. Have you ever read one of these things and thought to yourself, boy, I'm sure glad I read that. It cleared up a whole lot of confusion for me. Me neither. And yet mission statements continue to proliferate. To understand why, it might be helpful to unearth their genealogy. It's been well documented that an early cave dweller picked up a stone and carved the very first mission statement on a cave wall, on a cave wall while a T-Rex peered in for a snack. The statement read as follows, staying alive, staying alive, ah, 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 <laughs> chomp. Sadly, he never got to finish his statement. Mission statements are like locusts. Nowadays, it seems like every organization has a pressing need to justify its existence to a public just quivering with anticipation. At Acme Widgets, our mission is to provide superior products and quality service at an affordable price. Wow, I had no idea. I'll take two. And anyone who's ever sat in on one of those one of those things where there's a facilitator with the board and the, and the colored pens and the stars and all that stuff. I, I hope you can relate to this, okay? So I had no idea. Had the statement incorporated buzzwords like best practices, client-centric, outside the box, paradigm shift, organic growth, branding, and globalization, I would have taken three, maybe a dozen, Here's what I'd like to know. How did they ever complete the transcontinental railroad without a mission statement? How did Thomas Edison invent the light bulb? Are you telling me that Mount Rushmore was built without a clear, concise, organically synergistic mission statement? Now that takes guts. 
Let me repeat that. Now that takes guts. So, why in 2001 are we, is it amazing how things, the more things change, the more they stay the same? I could have said, so why in 2023? So why in 2001 are we under constant siege from this barrage of self-serving dribble? Here's my theory. Back in the mid 60s, an impressionable group of teenagers were awestruck by the popular television series, Star Trek. The show always began with Captain James T. Kirk describing the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. Its mission, to seek out new life forms, new civilizations, to boldly go where no man has gone before. It resonated even more if you were stoned. Eventually, these teenagers grew into adults. With their role model firmly in place, they did the natural thing. They imitated Captain Kirk and constructed mission statements of their own. And we've been paying a terrible price ever since. Now, it's one thing for people like Gandhi or Abraham Lincoln to have a mission statement. Clearly, they were on a mission. And organizations like NASA need to have one as well. After all, you want everyone at Mission Control to know precisely which planet you're pointing the rocket at. But how necessary is a mission statement if you're selling onion rings, chia pets, or snow tires? Unfortunately, it looks like mission statements are going to be with us for a while. Apparently, I was right. <laughs> They're going to be with us for a while. And since there's no avoiding these lemons, we might as well make lemonade. At the very least, let's level the playing field and allow every man, woman, and child to fashion a mission statement of their own. For convenience, the statement could be printed on business cards and pulled out whenever the need arises. And why, be, and why be limited to a single mission statement? Multiple mission statements allow for much greater flexibility. Truly enterprising people might carry a pocket full of assorted mission statements you never know when one of them might come in handy. For example, and I thought about this one really hard. For example, you're sitting in a Burger King, downing a triple Whopper combo meal, when your ex-wife walks through the door with her new squeeze, the handsome young doctor. You feeling this? No problem, you got this. You suck in your gut, wipe the ketchup off your face, and whip out the appropriate mission statement. Quote, to show up my ex-wife by walking up and telling her that I can't take the kids this weekend because the lingerie model I've been dating wants to fly me to Aspen to show me off to all of her friends. And while you're at it, ask her how the hair removal treatment is going. Hey, you know what? Maybe there's a buck in this for me, but how? I know I could become a consultant. Yeah, that's the ticket, a consultant. Get me an expensive suit, a fancy watch, a slick website, and charge $300 per hour for my oh so vital services. And then boldly go where I've never gone before, Tahiti. <laughs> All right, I'm just going to read one last thing, and then we're actually going to end by 7.30. Okay, so I keep going back to this same, um, the same theme. A, you don't need formal education to write. Lose that. It will just, it will just keep you forever from doing it. It's such a convenient ex excuse. Well, what do I know about writing? You know, plenty. You've lived a long time. Just start doing it. You don't need a professor to, to, with a red pen to tell you how to do it. You can do it on your own. And you can try different kinds. You can try poetry. You can try writing a memoir. There's, there's so many, you know, you can even write, write a short story. It's like, it doesn't, it's not like, oh, here's how you write a short story. It's just, um, for storytelling, it's kind of, I wouldn't say ne necessary, but it's helpful to understand story structure. And 
I would say there's a few books that, that will help you out with that. Books that if you're thinking about starting how to write. Um, Stephen King has a book on writing. It's both where he talks about his writing, but he also talks about his personal life. Um, trying to oh the, the one that I wrote was Natalie writing down the bones and I don't know her I can't think of her last name but if if anybody is is out there and can say who her last name is it's Natalie and I can't think of it and Goldberg Natalie Goldberg okay thank you. <laughs> Um, and that was the book that got me into writing. I remember I was on a plane in 1997, flying down to Miami, and I just read it, and it made me feel like I could do anything. I didn't take a class. When I was in college, I never took a creative writing course. But Natalie Goldberg, um, writing down the bones, if you're going to start and you're not sure, she will make you feel like you can write anything, like you can write Hamlet. So that's the book. Um, bird by Bird by, um, who was that? Bird by Bird, Anne. Anne Lamott, Anne Lamott. And a third one is, you have? Bird by Bird. Yeah, great. Um, and I can't think of the third one right now, but maybe I will. And Stephen King, so there, there are three of them. Bird by Bird. Natalie Goldberg, Stephen King, those three. You can read any of them, but it's even if even if you're not going to write, they're all really interesting, especially Stephen King, because he is really revealing. You know how people say, well, if you're going to write my story, tell the truth. He took that to heart. When he wrote his story, he talked about one of the books he was writing. And it's kind of one of the famous ones. And he had a cocaine addiction. And he would talk about being down in the basement at one o'clock in the morning, writing a chapter for that book with two swabs of cotton in his nose to catch the blood. Now that's someone I want to meet because that's someone telling the truth. That's someone who isn't afraid what you might find out and how many of us can say that, you know? So yeah, the Stephen King book is great. He talks about the writing, but he also talks about his personal life. Okay. So, um, just to follow up, I'm, I'm saying, you try anything you want. Just find out who's good at, at what you're trying to do and just read their stuff and go, I can do that. And you can, and you can. Just understand that nothing's out of bounds. So about five years ago, a friend of mine's son was moving to Nashville. He was pretty accomplished as a musician here in Maine. And I thought, well, you know, I've always wanted to write a song, but I don't know, leap about songwriting. So, but I thought, well, I know how to write and I could write the words to a song, even if I don't know chords or anything like that. And I gave it a try and I wrote, like in a three month period, I wrote five or six songs. And what I did was I just, I just looked at, now you can do this on the internet. I just looked at my favorite writers, you know, John Prine, Jackson Brown, Mary Chapin Carpenter, Paul Simon, Mark Knopfler of Dire Straits, all the people that I admired. And I just, you can just, you know, put in the title and all the lyrics come up and you can see how they wrote. You can see did they, you know, did they have more than two choruses? How long were their verses, four lines or six lines? It was really, again, it's like, just, just, I copied them. You know, I just copied my, you know, the people who do it the best. So I wrote about a half dozen. Five of them were, nice try, Sonny. <laughs> That's what they were. But one of them, one of them was a keeper. And this is it. This is called Ledger in the Sky. And I'm not going to sing it, obviously. And I, if, if anyone knows, anyone knows um, Garth Brooks, pick up my card, okay? Have him get in touch with me. So Ledger in the Sky. Jamie was a quiet man. He wasn't super cool. Days he worked security at the local middle school. The day began as always, children doing their thing. But at 9.17, shots rang out. Jamie rushed to the scene. He reached for his gun, 
He reached for his gun, but the bolt was jammed. And instead of storming the room, he froze, silent, wringing his hands. And here's the chorus. There's a ledger in the sky where our deeds are written down, where true worth is measured by our actions on the ground. Jamie never did time, for his was not a crime, but he was never acquitted of the cowardice in his mind. Sleep was endless torture with nightmares of that day, just another homeless man without much to say. There's a ledger in the sky where our deeds are written down, where true worth is measured by our actions on the ground. One night in the field, Jamie woke to a fire. A house was in flames and the situation was dire. He rushed to the house and found the family intact, shivering on the lawn with just the clothes on their back. A scared little girl hugging her bear shouted, Oliver, Oliver, at the red hot flare. Jamie dashed to the house, Jamie dashed to the house and disappeared inside. Then an old dog ran out and the little girl sighed. Just then the roof collapsed, just then the roof collapsed in a huge ball of flame and the nameless stranger was never seen again. The moon shone bright on that crisp autumn night as an entry was made in the book we all write. There's a ledger in the sky where our deeds are all linked, some are in pencil and some are in ink. And that's it folks. Thank you for hanging in there. I hope, I hope it was entertaining. And I hope it was entertaining for you. And uh, I enjoyed doing it. So yeah, good. thank you. Questions or comments, please feel free to type them in the chat. I have a question about the song. So was it indeed put to music? No, no. And it's and it's not in the book. It was just something that I, I tried. And it's it's almost writing. You have to approach writing like a child almost. Children think they can do anything. They'll just, they won't think, oh, no, that's not for me. I, I'm not that, you know. They just go, okay, let's try it. <laughs> and that's kind of how you have to approach it. Because if you think about it too long, you will talk yourself out of it. So just approach it like you would, um, like a child would, with like, okay, uh, let's let's try it. You know, I can do that. So hopefully this has inspired some of you to go out and buy that book and that fancy pen. And because uh, you're never too old. We have a Paul Sheridan, you know him. But I know Paul. Said, Great stuff. Thanks, Eddie. Wow. And uh, Dennis Harrington says, Mr. Saturday Night is pleased you use Don't Get Me Started. You know what that means? Mr. Saturday Night. I know Dennis Harrington. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's like, like, okay, so I'll give you guys money once I get back to Belfast. Okay. It's like, you know, I, I think you're each going to get a dollar in your future in this. So I'm glad you guys uh, got to see it tonight. People I know. Uh, it's Billy Crystal movie. Billy Crystal movie. Yeah. Mr. Saturday Night. Great movie. So yeah, having my name in the same sentence as Billy Crystal is, <laughs> is sacrilege. Is sacrilege. So. Well, that's it. Yeah. Anybody wants a book, got them here. And you can get it um, at Amazon. Once again, folks, before we hang up, don't get me started. Wait, mm -hmm. will you explain why is it titled that? Yeah, it was um, when I had my um, column for the Press Herald. I think it was called Don't Get Me Started. So it was just uh, good one. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, so folks. Much.